I'm Simon Adam, host of Crazy Making. Today, I speak with Dr. Fadi Shenouda. Dr. Shenouda is a critical disability studies scholar who draws on feminist new materialism to examine disabled and mad students' experiences in higher education. His scholarly contributions lie at the theoretical and pedagogical intersections of disability, MAD, and FAT studies to include socio-historical examinations that surface the interconnections of colonialism, racism, ableism, sanism, and queer and transphobia. Fadi also created and hosts the podcast, Disability Saves the World, where he interviews disabled, MAD, and FAT scholars, activists, and artists. He's an assistant professor at the Pauline Jewett Institute of Women's and Gender Studies at Carleton University, where he conducts his work diversely positioned as a queer, disabled, fat, person of color, immigrant and settler, living, working and creating on the ancestral and traditional territories of the Algonquin nation. Hi, Fadi, how are you? I'm well, thank you for having me. Thanks for appearing on the show. So, um, Tell us to start, what are you up to these days in terms of your research, your pedagogical work? I'm a brand new faculty member at Carleton University. Um, and so in part, I'm creating um, brand new courses in disability, MAD and FAT studies, which is really exciting. Uh, this will be the first MAD studies course that's being taught at Carleton. And next year, it'll be the first FAT studies course that's being offered at Carleton. Um, and in the fact that I get the opportunity to introduce students to this literature, uh, that, you know, students get the opportunity to do some of this critical work is kind of really very exciting. And so alongside that, I'm also, um, hopefully applying for a grant, um, to do some work on distress and suicidality. Um, there, um, one specific issue that I'm interested in is, um, student suicides at Canadian universities. We don't know the number. We don't record the statistics in Canada. Unlike uh, minority world countries, Australia, UK, um, even the US, who all have statistics around student suicides, it's not something that we keep in Canada um, because of a whole host of reasons like privacy issues and uh, who gets to declare what a suicide or not. Um, but, you know, we have all this money, millions and millions of dollars being put into suicide prevention, when I think we should start looking at really pedagogical interventions of what it is like to teach at, you know, the end of the world, um, you know, in the Anthropocene with um, racial justice, climate justice, you know, um, the, the importance of what it's like to teach and learn at this moment in time and how actually teaching and learning is one way to survive. Can you tell us a little bit, I, have you done any preliminary research so far on distress and suicidality in the context of higher ed? And I if, did. I, what, if, what have you discovered so far? Well, I mean, the I got a tiny little grant from Carlton here to do some research. And so um, the one of the things that we're doing, the methodology that we're using um, is um, an FOI request. So freedom of information request at all, every single university and at every ministry. And so, um, you know, I've already met with the ministry in British Columbia, um, who had, a, you know, about an hour meeting with me over Microsoft Teams, it was four of them and one of me. And it was so interesting for them to tell me that the ministry doesn't actually uh, communicate at all between universities, there's absolutely no oversight when it comes to mental health or suicides. Um, the ministry runs a, a program called Here to Talk, which is essentially an app where students can go in and, and check in to seek help and support. And that's the sort of kind of intervention that we have at higher education when it comes to kind of mental health and suicide. Everything else is done in-house. So each university has its own framework, its own policies, its own procedures. Recently, a colleague of mine introduced to me the, the fact that most universities have something called the student tragedy protocol, which is essentially the step-by-step -step, uh, approach that they take when there is a death, when there is a student death, whether it's suicide or not. Um, and of course, someone asked to see this protocol and they were told they can't. So that's why freedom of information requests are so important into this, are central to this research approach because we really do, do need to see this information to understand the kind of discourse around 
um, student suicide and distress. Thanks for explaining that. Now, I've had a, another guest on the show previously who had talked about uh, an FOI request and uh, also essentially explained it. But um, for our listeners who would probably benefit from being reminded what an FOI request is, do you mind just explaining that, Fadi? Absolutely. So um, an FOI request stands for Freedom of Information Request. Every public body um, is a place where you can actually uh, request uh, documents. You can't request anything else and you can't ask questions. The purpose of, a, of, a, of a freedom of information is to fact just collect data or information. Um, in every province, it costs differently. Of course, in Alberta, it costs $25 to put in a request. In Ontario here, it costs $5. Um, in other parts of the country, it's free. And uh, the universities came under freedom of inf information. Um, I think it's either in the late 90s or the early 2000s that they finally came under the freedom of information. And they then are uh, required to release information when someone makes a request. You can make as many requests as you want. They can be as detailed or as broad. Um, uh, and more and more, they're becoming a part of kind of research. Journalists use them all the time, but academics, in fact, have been very reluctant to use them as part of kind of data collection um, until very recently. And just to add to that, this would be information that is not available in the public domain, that's not yes. accessible. Yeah. Yes, it's, if it's not available in the public domain. And so we, you know, we did research. Um, this is the student group, Students for Barrier Free Access at the University of Toronto. We did research to collect the manuals for something called the bursary for students with disabilities. And these manuals are where all the caps, the total amount that you can ask for, for services or supports, like for example, a laptop or a computer, those are the same thing, a laptop, a computer, or, uh, you know, um, other forms of services. Um, and the manual, even though it sits on the counselor's desk, they're not allowed to give it to you. The ministry forbids it. And it's actually in the manual itself that don't give this to students. And so we filed a freedom of information with this. We got the last 13 manuals and we wrote a paper about it. Um, and it's in the educational journal. Yeah, we found that funding had been stagnant for about 20 years. So it's, um, it's really quite a powerful tool. I agree. It really is. Uh, would you, um, do you remember the title of the paper that you wrote? Do you want to mention it? Yeah, it's called Neoliberal Methods of Disqualification. Um, that's the, that's the main title. And there's a little bit about educational supports in Canada, disability rated educational supports in Canada. Awesome. And what journal is that again? It's in um, education policy. Awesome. Katie, I want to just step back a little bit and just talk about your sort of area of expertise, your substantive area, fat studies, disability studies. Um, I just want to ask you uh, in terms of um, uh, relating that to psychiatry and psychiatrization, what sort of intersections do you see between disability, fatness, and psychiatrization? I mean, I think they're so intimately connected um, in, a, in a paper that's coming out um, um, hopefully in the fat studies reader in Canada, um, I think next year sometime, uh, I talk about um, um, the, you know, fat and fat studies and mad studies being um, estranged sisters. Um, you know, they're, they're so intimately connected in terms of their theoretical orientations, how they in fact started both of them from the political and activist uh, arms of the movement, you know, in Mad Pride and in Fat Liberation. Um, but they don't really, scholars haven't really put them together. And one of the reasons why I think more and more they should be put together, we should do this kind of intersectional analysis is because the fat body and the mad body or the psychiatrist body are both understood as out of control. They are both bodies that are on the brink, that are in fact some both bodies are, you know, have already fallen off of the edge, right? Um, these are bodies that are considered too much, and um, and definitely ones that are thought of as dying. And so, uh, what does it mean to to put these two bodies together to think about the relationship um, and how you know sanism and fat phobia kind of work hand in hand? 
to produce one another. You know, the fat body is one that can control itself. Uh, and, um, you know, and the insane body is very much the same thing. It's one that is totally out of control. I'm hearing you talk about this body that's out of control. And I'm thinking about the monstrosizing of the fat body and the, and the disabled body. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, um, they're really the the really kind of maddening part is that like they both also have really problematic solutions right cure is such an uh, uh or you know psychiatric intervention as a form of um solution for both bodies right for both the bad body the disabled body the the fat body is such an interesting one because it doesn't work right like and in fact does more harm than good um diets do not work right uh, ninety-eight percent of diets fail, which means um, most people end up gaining weight after they've lost weight, then lose, then losing it. And so much of psychiatric intervention is so violent, right? Especially on racialized bodies. Um, and so, uh, again, how the solutions that we come up with in order to intervene on these different body minds, right, is something that needs more critical integration and analysis yeah <clears throat> and by virtue of entering that sort of psychiatric relationship already assumes that the body is a problem that the that that um is um sort of uh subsumed under the auspices of medicine and psychiatry for it to be intervened upon cured uh treated and so on and so forth um absolutely so even at the discursive level, it's problematic too. You did mention a fat studies reader. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and a, a bunch of amazing scholars are putting together a kind of first fat studies reader in Canada, and um, and this one paper that I'm that I've written about um, talks about the fat body and the mad body as both um, under, out of, and beyond control. That's part of the title. Um, another plug, it seems. <laughs> and um, what's really interesting is that, like, I do this idea of the fat body uh, under control. So this is the fat body that is constantly trying to be maintained. Um, uh, uh, the the fat and mad body as you know being contained in various ways. Yeah. So the fat body is out of control, right? One that is completely beyond saving, and then the one under control. Um, is one where there's constantly a psychiatric intervention. And what's really interesting is that I've, I, I did a little bit of a review of various weight loss uh, companies, major weight loss companies, specifically Weight Watchers and Noom, with N-O-O-M, which um, I feel like if you're fat, they're constantly taunting you everywhere you go on social media, just like telling you to lose weight through cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and they are... You know, they're just diets, but what's really compelling is that they've switched over to psychiatric discourse and that they use the term wellness to talk about weight loss now, right? They've abandoned the idea of diets as working because they know that they don't and they know that people are catching on. And so they've actually tapped in quite um, uh, knowingly to psychiatric discourses, specifically around like wellness and resiliency and those kinds of things in order to promote a sense of well-being, overall well-being. Even though they're still trying to sell you foods, you still have to count on points. You know, you're doing those kinds of things. Noom is really interesting. Um, in the paper I call them, um, you know, they are both interested in intervention. So intervening on the fat body itself, but also in prevention. So they're interested in preventing you from getting uh, fat, and for getting diabetes, getting, you know, various types of uh, illnesses or experiences. Um, and so really every body is a Noom customer, right? And it's sort of, in the paper, I call it the minority report of health, right? It's like, I'm, I'm referencing the Tom Cruise movie here. Um, before you're sick, you're already sick, right? Because fatness is so horrible right, that we're going to get to even before you become fat. It's this idea of the childhood obesity, right? We're going to get to the children before they can ever become obese. And Weight Watchers, in fact, made obese children part of their campaign at one point, and they received such massive critical pushback um, against it that they actually dropped it in the end. Wow. 
uh, you know, you're talking about that and I'm, I'm drawing points of connection to all sorts of medicalized human, human development issues or, or natural sort of human phenomena like hair loss and sexuality and aging mm-hmm. and all of that. Um, it's frighteningly uh, sort of the medical discourse or the medicalization, the medical establishment industry or whatever have you is growing and sort of spreading more and more tentacles into the everyday human condition. Yeah, I mean, as psychiatric language becomes more accessible to people, it then becomes, you know, important for these corporations to take it on as an explanatory method, right? It's how they sell their logics to people. If wellness and self-care and resiliency are now part of like morning coffee shows, plus the news media, plus, you you know, your yoga studio, like it's then why not, of course, then it being part of the weight loss industry, right? And so the connections there between psychiatry and you know fat phobia is so clear absolutely oh yeah Fady, let me ask you if you had one bone to pick with psychiatry given this what would it be um there is something about entering you know a therapist's office whatever it might be a psychiatrist's office a psychologist's office a a psychotherapist's office any of the size really um there is something about entering the office as a fat body that already marks you as like different and, and so there is something about people who need in various forms of intervention, who wants to access those forms of intervention to not automatically be considered out of control because they're fat, right? Um, I think the whittling down of all challenges for, um, for fat folks to their fatness is really very violent for us. You know, I've had so many experiences of entering just a general practitioner's office, right, where I've had to stand on two scales for them to get my weight. And like, that's not how scales work. Legitimately not how they work. You can't actually get a real reading. You know, I've gone into doctor's offices, they didn't have the right cuff around my arm, so they can't take my blood pressure, even though they can get one for my wrist, or they can't find my vein to draw blood, right, even though they can get blood from my hand. Just like these very like simple ways of um, you know accessing treatments that become very hard, and that extends to you know um, various psi communities or very psi uh, industries. Um, so fat folks really you know come to you for support. I feel like believe them and believe what they're saying. And if they're not talking about their fat body as an issue for them, then don't link it to that. Right don't automatically assume that that's what's going on. And I think like, I want to also tell a whole bunch of fat people who might be listening, whatever size you might be, that dieting is not going to work. It never has, it never will. Do not diet. Um, It it really is quite a violent experience to put your body through. And many studies have shown that if you've carried the same amount of weight that you've had for seven years, your body thinks you're killing it. And so it's constantly wanting to bounce back. Um, so that's just, it's really something interesting to think about your body is protecting itself more than anything else. Right. And of course here I'm thinking not, um, uh, not that the body mind is separate, right. But, um, that you can't always understand how your body is experiencing, um, those kind of massive changes. Very interesting. Thanks for that. Uh, Fady, you might've already ventured into my last question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, if you were speaking to fat identified and or disabled folks at risk for being psychiatrized, what sort of words of wisdom or piece of advice would you give them? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very similar to what I, what I was saying before, but I just think that there's such an inclination to reduce complex experiences to um, a very visible part of your identity and um, people will want to do that, so especially people in various uh, places of power, especially in the sci industry. And, and I think you really need to be able to push back against that. It's, you know, in order, uh, in some ways also to like remove yourself from spaces like that. I mean, yeah, there's something really quite violent about the reduction of all experiences to one size. Um, as the source of the problem in and of itself. And I think a lot of fat people know that that's not true, right? Um, 
while you may experience a different body, it's often how that body is perceived in the world, i.e. experiences of fat phobia that might be the thing that causes trauma more than anything else. Thanks, Fadi, and thank you for joining me today on Crazy Making. Thank you for having me. Subscribe and listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. Reach out to us by email at crazymaking at yorku.ca. That's crazymaking at y-o-r-k-u dot c-a. And follow us on Instagram at crazymakingpodcast. Thanks for listening.